we'll just start out by having them introduce themselves and uh, what their operation size is, what they do, and, and maybe a little bit about themselves. Glenn Gardrich, uh, Cabot, Vermont, and Eden, Vermont. Uh, I haven't had an operation lately, so. Uh, uh, yeah, so anyway, we, we uh, still run a Cabot operation where we sell equipment, we directly retail maple things to the traveling public, and we boil there from about 24,000 taps and have another 6,000 that we sell sap from. Um, <clears throat> and uh, at Eden, we're currently at 117,000 taps and still boiling there. Um, last night we had a surprise visit from some hooligans uh, that came in and <laughs> don't, don't around. Look at me. And, don't uh, look at me. We had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be boiling there this afternoon. And again on Monday after that, we don't know. But uh, we've had a, Bruce isn't here, is he? We've had a, an okay year. <laughs> if Bruce is here, it's been a horrible year. But uh, pretty good year. And it's a cold climate. That's why we're still going. And uh, we're here to talk about the rest of what we're still going. Mark Earlston, um, Central Ohio. Um, I have been full-time in Maple since I was 15, um, 30, 35 years later, I, uh, am still in business out of, a something to prove a point to people, um, stubbornness, um, do a lot of work. I think I end up usually on these panels cause I'm kind of a guy that deals with the flat ground. A little bit and uh, we don't like I said yesterday we don't necessarily have real flat ground where I'm at but it kind of rolls every which direction and that so uh, um, we tap about 2600 and that's uh, a medium size operation down where we're at it's not a hobby like it is up here so I'm John Ripkowitz. I own uh, Red Leaf Hollow Farms here in Vermont. So we have a 23,000 tap operation here. I sit on the board of directors at Leader and I uh, own a retail store called The Maple Shop in Chester, New Jersey, where we sell syrup things like Glenn said and equipment and help other people learn how to do this. Okay, and just uh, to note, it's uh, be great if it's an open discussion. So if you have a question at all, we, we love the interaction. Feel free to ask uh, at any point. We can, we can back up and, and change directions here as well. So we're going to start with a general question for you guys. And what, what do you think makes a good sugar bush from management um, to potentially just high yields? What do you think makes, makes a good sugar bush? Let's start at the other end. <laughs> sure, yeah. So for me, it's, it's um, design, how everything's laid out, um, not only for production, but for uh, maintenance and roads. I'll probably say roads like 10 times today, but access. Um, I, I, I think the access is a, is a very design of the system and access uh, as far as tree quality. Um, if you have a very thick stand and you just can't bring it in your heart to go in and do thinning, I suggest you just do a small section and just do the very worst junky stuff first and watch what happens. And uh, you will start getting your chainsaw out a lot more. It's, um, I can take you into sections of our, our family where our big woods is. Uh, my father bought that property, I think in 1976. Uh, my brother was a forestry major at Ohio State. And uh, so we did a lot of thinning work and there's the, places there now it's been a while but you can really tell the difference where we worked hard at it and where we didn't where where we did the thinning it, it's a night and day difference in there um don't be afraid to cut a maple tree down to make better maple trees is is one thing i will say and if you're really uncomfortable with what to do i'm sure every state like our state has forestry resources there's people that will come and help you uh, to decide how to do that Good, and we need to get sap out of the woods, don't we? So road access, 
it's going to be a pump station and transported to your sugar house. Mm -hmm. Make sure the road you're planning to use is going to be suitable for spring travel. Uh, sometimes it's a great woods, but a poor road. And it's no good to make sap if you can't get it out. And we, I think a lot of us saw poor roads this spring. It was a really rough year on our roads. Uh, power availability, can you get electricity at that? station. Uh, we've created some kind of innovative methods of uh, making power available, uh, being able to move electricity over fairly long distances uh, with ease and uh, affordably. That's the key. An electrician will tell you it's not possible, but we've figured out some ways to do it affordably. Um, then aspect I really prefer a wood that slopes to the east. We used to always say south, but south can warm up too much in the mid part of the day. East will get going in the morning and then coast through the afternoon without overheating. Uh, west and north, those are tough ones. Uh, the sun is very high in the sky in the spring uh, until now, and uh, uh, so they can be kind of slow to get started. Okay, so uh, we're starting to see a trend of tapping earlier and earlier and earlier. So where maybe you started tapping in March um, a number of years ago, that has pushed up to, in some cases, February, January, and, and maybe December, depending on volume. Um, what do you think about that, and, and what do you guys do? So uh, because of the size of our operation, we have to start early. There's no no way around it. Um, we only do our woods with four to six guys. So we have to put the time in. This year we experimented and went super early. We went December, which is normally January. So we went December and we got lucky because January we only had four days in the woods. So it benefited us in the long run, but we won't tap below 20 degrees for the plastics, the equipment and the people. It's, it's rough on that. We are on a mountain like this. So there's a lot of work just to get out there. So we break a lot of things. I think I have more four wheelers in the shop than I do in the field half the time, but. <laughs> so I like it, I do it, I do it early. And part of it is the check valves. I feel comfortable doing it knowing we have the check valve spouts. Um, for me, with the help I have in that, it is usually we start tapping about as soon as we can get ready. Um, with all the other things involved in my maple operation, um, sometimes our actual production takes a back burner. Uh, I say the, 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 the fun stuff uh, for us, for me, takes a back burner to the things that you do to earn a living in the business. Um, but to a, to a real big extent anymore, the earlier the better for us. I'm not thrilled if we miss sap runs. Yeah, you don't want to miss those first ones because that's when your quality sap happens. Missing one today? Okay, that's fine. We're making less than premium syrup right now, uh, but you don't want to miss those early ones. And is our climate changing? I think we all recognize that something's happening. It may be just a bullet trend it might be something real um, but uh, most folks are finding that a sugar content keeps going down every year uh, if you notice that uh, we don't get the sugar content that we used to um, and the warm-up trends well we've always had generate thaws haven't we historically we didn't pay any attention to that that's just a a free day of the winter but now we want to get sap on that January thaw so uh, we start tapping uh, our aim is to start on December 15th and we want to get it all done by the end of February uh, so it takes us a long time to tap them all we could tap faster if we use lower scale help but we don't want to do that tapping is the most important thing that we do getting it done right and well saves you a lot of time later on and so we start early with a really crackerjack team and try to get it done as best we can 
Not as fast as we can, uh, but the best we possibly can. So are you unanimous in uh, check valves is what makes December possible? Great question. And I'm going to be the black sheep here. <laughs> I will live at my sugar house during the season. And if there's going to be a day above freezing, my vacuum pumps are on if those trees are drilled and with that in mind and they don't shut off until that thaw is done and there's no possibility that sap could go back in the tree so we've had some struggles with check valves the very early ones the ball would fall out i think we all went through that and then we made the corrections i think they work really well now but here's here's what i suggest if you don't live at your sugar house, then check valves are a great asset to you. If you have an engine-powered vacuum pump, check valve spouts are a very good asset to you. If you have a mechanical releaser, they're a very good asset to you. Um, but with our dedication, um, we haven't found them to be a big advantage to us. So. I think for most of us, there would be a big advantage. So, Do you want to speak on why? Because any time that a vacuum pump should quit, whether electric or gas powered, um, you lose your vacuum. The tree has, this is a tree, and we drill a hole in that tree. Stay. <laughs> Initially, in the first hour, we vacuumize just a thin column above and below that drill hole. After a 10 hour session of vacuum on and wood thawed, that zone starts to spread to maybe 25% of the radius of, that, of the circumference of that tree and keeps going up and down and migrating away. When a vacuum pump stops, the tubing loses its vacuum relatively quickly, but that tree continues to have vacuum in it. So it's pulling, trying to pull sap back into itself. And it's just like us, if we have a laceration on our arm and we dip that arm in bad stuff, dirty stuff, we're going to get an infection and the tree is just the same. So if sap is allowed to migrate back into, by the way, there's a bonus for everybody that sits in the front row. <laughs> um, come right up close. It's not church. <laughs> I'm not singing. I, don't know. <laughs> well, I was thinking about it. <laughs> so we don't want that tree to ever be able to pull sap back into itself because that will doom our season. Now, proof is in the pudding, right? If your woods has its biggest sap run of the season in the last third of the season, you know you've done really well. But if your woods shuts off and your neighbors are still going, you've done bad. If your wood shuts off so that your best run of the season is in the first third, uh, that's bad. And here's why I say that. The bigger trees don't get thawed out generally, clear to the center until the season is about done. Your trees freeze. <laughs> <laughs> the snow Never heard is, of that. <laughs> yeah, you won't believe this one either. The snow is packed around the trees in the early part of the season. They can't get thawed out into the ground quickly. So that first third of the season is just getting things going. The final third is really where your crop is made. Our snow has gone down, the trees are getting thawed to the core, and especially the big ones can really start to produce. But if that hole's already contaminated, it's done. You've lost it. And the other proof, how much syrup you make per tap. You know, and I hear it all the time, well, my trees aren't that good, they can't make that much. That's wrong. Trees are trees. Whether uh oh, I'm going to be careful. Whether they're in Wisconsin, Maine, or Vermont, though Vermont makes the best syrup. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. 
Are you that? Um, I'm pointing at the camera. <laughs> Seriously. I've installed tubing in Wisconsin to Maine and virtually every state in between. And I find that trees can produce good sap, make good syrup anywhere that they grow um, and in great volume. I'm not in a high volume area. Okay, that sounds weird, doesn't it? Because we're a very cold climate. I think the best area for volume production is Interstate 90 across New York State, kind of in that corridor up through, right up the Champlain Basin. That's really prime pounds per tap area. They get the right weather, not too cold, not too hot. And uh, here, generally, we're too cold. This year, it's kind of panned out good for us. So, uh, is Bruce here yet? <laughs> we made a little so. <laughs> well, to, to show you, we have we actually have two woods. We have 10,000 taps on whole liter woods, and I wanted to evaluate the CDL stuff, though I'm not a CDL fan. So we have 10,000 trees on, on the CDL system, and we stopped Friday. Went to the sugar house last night. We took a little trip. The check valve woods is still running. The CDLs is not. No vacuum, but it's still coming in. Um. Uh, yeah, uh, there you go. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll allude to the to the check valve thing. The difference in price is what, Kevin? Less than thirty cents a piece. Is that right? Twenty eight cents a piece. To me, that's less than a gallon of sap per tap. I am not a research facility. I can never prove to you whether I get that gallon. I didn't have to do anything different putting them in, installing anything there. To me, it's an insurance policy because as much as I want to say my woods is always going to be tight, when I go out to fix that little squirrel neck, I put my tubing tool on it and I make a big leak. There's always that leaks that you're creating. and You create a leak while you're fixing a leak and you create a bigger one than what was there. To me, for less than a gallon of sap, in my mind, I think they make that much and I think it's worth it. So to break even, I need I need less than one gallon of sap per tap from that check, check valve. Um, that, that is my theory on it and I have no way to prove whether we get it or we don't because I'm not a research facility. And what's a gallon of sap worth? If I'm buying it, it's not worth much. <laughs> <laughs> right, but if it's in my tank, and let's say it tests two percent, it's worth a buck a gallon if it doesn't cost me much to turn it in, sir. Okay, so think about it that way. Uh, you're buying it. There's costs involved to do that, but when it's in your tank, to spill some or to miss some, you don't want to. So. If there's any chance that it makes you more sad, then it's worth the expense. Mm -hmm. so I, with a large number of taps, when you're tapping, um, you probably have a portion of your woods, if, you're, if there's a thaw, the sap will run, and you're not ready to process it. Do you, do you turn vacuum on in that portion to keep your tap Why, why wouldn't I be ready to process it? Well, maybe you are. <laughs> <laughs> of course I am. Well, you are, okay. So you, well, I see. you have 5,000 taps out of 120,000, you, yeah. you would still try to process that sap? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I didn't mean to make fun of your question. Yeah. A year ago, we weren't ready to boil it. We had concentrated sap, 30 brick sap, set in our refrigerated tank for six weeks before we could boil it. Our evaporator wasn't in, and so we, we stored it that long before I just we did saw it. the video of your steam evaporator. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, that's why I say, to me, to answer your question, for me, we do one thing, but we propose for everybody to do something different. And if you look at any of the research that's been done, you'll see that for most people, there is a benefit to check mail spells, simple as that. And I think they're on 20 cents difference, aren't they? They are, but yeah. I think so, yeah. Um. So a, a quart of sap each, 
on the little bit of the do I turn my vacuum pump on or not. My vacuum pump turns on the day we start tapping and it turns off the day we finish pulling spouts. Um, I don't try to guess it. I don't go, oh man, I gotta get over there and turn it on. It, I turn it on and it runs. Uh, the, the reason we leave it, even if it's two or three days at the end of the season where we are done, done boiling, I feel that it keeps the tubing a little better to move forward into the next year as long to keep that little bit of movement, whatever movement we're getting a liquid. Um, that's why I, I don't, I don't go, well, we're not going to boil anymore. Turn my vacuum pump off. Um, don't know if that's right, wrong, or if it does me any good, but that's what we do. You guys talked a, a bunch about tapping. Um, what t what techniques do you use for tapping, they, they, um, especially for a new person, you know, with big crews or small crews in the woods? You should probably talk about the precision <laughs> tapping. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, we we um. Like Glenn said, uh, we, it's better to have good help than, than a lot of help. It pays off when you've got to find leaks on a 23,000 tap system that's over 1,000 a, a acres. You just don't, you don't have the time. They take up, week, up, up to a week without a monitoring system. Every day of that week is thousands of dollars in missed revenue. So if, if there's somebody that's new to our crew, we use a precision tapper. Um, I'll let Glenn talk a little more about it, but they're worth their weight in gold, especially for somebody that's new or you're just unsure or if maybe they're older or whatever, but really it's, it's um, otherwise than that, we use a, a, a drill stop on a drill and we're super meticulous. So it's quick to the tree. We spend our time evaluating where the old hole was. And I'd like, if, if Ken, I like to quarter the tree, so I don't like to be close. So that's where the evaluation is. Look for the old holes and try to get as far away as you can up and down from them. And then our drill stop is there so we don't go too deep. And that's where we take our time. So it's quick to the tree, spend as much time as you need evaluating, and then it's, it's precise. Because that's where, that's where you're gonna benefit from. I, I, I'm gonna make a comment about tapping. I'll let Glenn get into <clears throat> technicalities and that of it. Sometimes take in mind when you're out there, you are in the woods doing something that people don't even envision what it is, outdoors, doing something I hope that you love. Um, obviously we all do it, or most of us do it as part of our income or all of our income. Enjoy yourself. I think people get so caught up in, oh, I gotta get this main line done. Enjoy the day. And I get it. There's a lot of days when you're tapping that aren't an enjoyable day. Uh, it can be some pretty nasty weather. I think it, when we when we started taking that attitude that we're going to enjoy the day, we're going to work our butts off at it. But we're, we're but at the end of the day, we get done what we get done. That's all we could do. We worked as hard as we could. We're going to enjoy ourselves while we're out here. I thought that that mindset made us better at it. You know, it was more of a positive mindset of enjoy the day, get done what we get done, not I have to get this done. Um, it slowed me down a little bit, did a better job tapping, not a faster job, a better job tapping. I, I think that's one little thing I would, I would appreciate where you're at. Uh, it, it, it's a beautiful place to be. Yeah. And you're getting quality over quantity which pays off in the long run. So that's a great point. You yeah. know, you wouldn't think to make that point, so I'm yeah. glad you did. Uh, <laughs> if it's drudgery and, you know, you're not in great shape, the snow is deep, the snowshoes are heavy, and it's hard to go from one tree to the next. But on that journey, while you're traveling from one tree to the next, let's say that post beside Mike is the next tree I'm gonna tap. As I'm walking to it, don't look down. Look up. Start from the top of that tree and look down. 
what defects are there up in the top of that tree that I should know about before I even think about drilling a hole in it? Um, a maple bore scar across it, um, a broken branch. What is there up there? And does that tree grow straight up and down or does it do a 180 degree corkscrew on the way down to where you're working? So try to follow the grain of that tree down if there's a defect up in the top or in the bottom. So identify, know the tree as you're walking to it. Don't waste those steps. Um, then when you get to the tree, you kind of said, which quadrant of that tree do I want to be in? I'm not a pattern tapper guy. Uh, I know Cornell preaches pattern tapping, but I'll tell you this, if you're too close to last year's hole, you'll suck air right through from last year's hole into this year's hole. And I want to be, like you said, as far away from last year's hole as I can, or as far away from any damage on that tree as I can. Whether I've got to go up, down, whatever it is, we tap pretty high. Um, there's a, I have a friend in Pennsylvania that never drills a hole above his knee. He wants to save those logs. And uh, <laughs> it's interesting. When I saw his system and the tubing's down at knee height, I said, how does that work? You know, that'd be buried all winter at our place. <clears throat> Uh, we can have six feet of snow in our upper woods, and you just have to work with it. So, um, Make, makes untapping fun. <laughs> <laughs> when we drill the hole, if you don't use a precision tapper, I'm going to use this as my tree so I don't interfere with anybody. If this is my tree and I've identified that I want to tap right here, I'll get, you know how you play golf? I don't know. You guys don't play golf, do you? <laughs> no. Skiing, anything like that. You learn how to position your body. Well, tapping is just like that. So as I step to the tree, my final two steps align my body so that I can reach that spot nicely. And I am kind of braced up. So if a snowshoe slumps in a little bit, I don't break off and drill a bit in the tree. Uh, I've got a basis to work from. So I square up to it. I like to get my elbow against the tree if I don't have a precision tapper. I hold the drill in two hands, not like Matt Dillon shooting a revolver. <laughs> and isn't it funny that he can pick off a mosquito at 100 yards with that thing, but if there's a guy hiding behind a wagon wheel, he can't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> so I get up here and I lock in and I go straight in, straight out. I don't let the drill move. If I do the free hand, one hander, that drill's going to bubble up and down. And you don't see it because you're behind it. But if you watch somebody drill a tree and they're not doing it right, you watch that drill, it'll do this a little bit. And these drill bits that we like to use are really sharp cutting drill bits. They need to be. You want it to slice the fibers of wood, not just smash it. And so, when we bobble, that's when we create a noble pole. And it will always be a bob or blow. The side wood cuts hard because that's with the grain. And the bobbing below is what the drill bit cuts easily. So we'll end up with a noble pole that will be really hard to stuff the seal. And we don't want to suck any air into that hole, do we? To stop bacterial growth, we put our system into a very deep vacuum. Whenever we break that vacuum and introduce oxygen, now bacteria can grow really good. So a deep vacuum is hard for bacteria to grow. Then to tap the spout in, what do you use? Sunshine. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Some the old 20-ounce East Wing hammer works really good because I can carve out the claws a little bit and pull spouts with that same tool. That's the wrong thing. It was wrong when we drove bucket spouts. It's wrong even more so with plastic spouts. A light mallet. We use a nylon hat, aluminum handled mallet. Downstairs, Kevin's got a display of different packing hammers that they sell. Those are the right thing to use. Kind of a soft space, and they hit square on. A rounded face isn't good. And so you tap that in. I actually use just finger movement manipulate the hammer. It's not driving a 20-penny spike. Uh, we just 
just hit it like way about six times per spell. Now the first two were just winding that spout into the hole. The next two really get it seated. And the final two is just an insurance to make sure that you get it seated. Now everybody says, well, you can hear the difference. Yeah, I can. But I can hear that same difference with 20 ounce D string hammer uh, if you're really whacking that in. It sounds different when you hit the bottom of the hole. Um, <laughs> you want to get it in just snug enough so it doesn't leak, but not any further than that. The further it goes in, the more layers of wood you just gasket in so you can't get sapped out of it. Any questions? Yeah. Basic question How deep do you drill? Great question. So, if this is a, a medium sized, really healthy yeah. tree, we'll go as deep as two inches. We set our precision tapper for two inches. If I suspect, you know, I think all of us have cut and split quite a lot of wood, haven't we? <laughs> if we do a post mortem on this tree and analyze the tree, can we determine how much white wood there is available to us? And where is the hole we put in that tree 40 years ago? The likelihood of hitting something decayed wood is higher the deeper you go. So if I suspect this tree is damaged internally, I'll go something less than two inches. Uh, and whatever I think it needs. If when that drill bit comes out of the hole, I see brown wood on it, first thing you do is kick yourself in the butt. <laughs> That's hard to do with snow shoes on. But kick yourself in the butt because you didn't analyze the tree appropriately before you drilled it. The second thing you do, you drill a new hole. And if we do that, we always drill the hole below the lateral line. And the likelihood of hitting better wood down there is better. We haven't tapped down there before. And uh, we set our stops at two inches or precision tapper. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll knock the guy or all give the guys in the other building down the road there a plug. The precision tapper is is very, very nice. Um, it, it, it works quite well. And, and but we, we set it two inches. I'm the same with Glenn. Depending a little bit on tree, I will back off. I can I can back off easy. I can't make it any deeper than that. They're marked on the, on the barrel at an inch and a half and an inch. And it's okay to tap a tree only an inch deep if you suspect there's decayed wood inside. What makes the precision tapper work so good is you have to push against the spring to drill the hole. Then instead of reversing your, your musculature, <laughs> if I had a stethoscope, you'd think I was a doctor. <laughs> That's what, you know, on TV. If I walk I, into the doctor's office and you're there, I'm going to the doctor's <laughs> office. <laughs> when you, get to the bottom, you're ready to pull out now. I don't have to pull the drill out of the hole. The spring pushes it out for me. And because it's engaged on the tree, it's pushing against that, that base, so it's always maintaining straight on. And the spring is what makes it do that. So that's why they work so good for us. So yeah, if, if we're not using a precision tapper, I generally set the stops at an inch and a half. It's kind of a happy medium for us. Yeah. That way, whoever it is can make a judgment call to at that point, but it, it's kind of a safe bet, kind of middle of the road. And one thing you said for a new guy that has an experience, that's true. I'm probably about as far from a new guy as we got in this room. Now, nah, maybe not. <laughs> <And> <laughs> I don't know how many thousands of holes I've drilled in my lifetime, but I use a precision tapper for every hole that I drill. And none of my crew works without one. Yes? You were talking about evaluating the tree before you tap. Um, we had one line going into our into our main line close to our collection point today, uh, this year. Only had two trees on the line. And I could see fluttering in it. Couldn't find the leaks. Couldn't find any squirrel shoes, any problems, whatever. 
when we untapped, we were pumping water up the line and clean them out, and the water was pouring right out the tree about 15 feet up. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And when I, I turned off the pump, it was coming right out the tap hole. Yeah. Yep. We won't tap that tree again. No. No, that's good. At that time, if you find that problem, fix it right today. Whether you're on your first leak check pass through the woods and you find a tree like that, take the drop line right out, put a connector in. You're not gonna make that mistake again. Mm -hmm. um, and lots of times people will say, oh yeah, I'm gonna take that out next summer. Oh no, you won't remember that. Cause you've got a few sleepless nights ahead of you before the season's done. So that's, that's a good point about what you bring with you. So we don't bring a full kit with us when we tap, but we do bring a repair tool and a small bag of repair fittings. So it's not a huge, giant full bag, but there's enough to, if we find something like that, you, you do it right then and there. Absolutely. Yeah. We don't walk through and do full maintenance, but it's just. When you drill tap hole and you hit non-conductive wood, brown wood, yeah. how much less sap are you gonna get out of that tap? Well. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. You'll get some sap. It might not be desirable sap. That that you suck down the squirrel nest uh, won't be desirable sap because that squirrel is using your tap hole as a urinal. And uh, <laughs> secondly, you've got a vacuum leak. So not only do you lose the sap of that tree, but many trees around it. And it's a hard leak to find, isn't it? You struggle Extremely the whole hard season leak to, find. to find it. Yeah. I, I was already, I was born crazy, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, got that covered. Do you, do you read your drops? Like when you're checking for leaks, you see, okay, at my T, before my T is definitely a leak, after my T is definitely not a leak. You read it in the drop, but I'll flip my T around and read how the drop was, and I'll see the flood of it. And you notice, like, using those clear scouts, you can tell how it's come out of the tree. Well, uh, what he's saying is clear spouts were a wonderful invention. Uh, very fascinating. I remember standing in the woods, watching how sap runs out of a tree for over an hour the first year we put them in. I was just fascinated why I never knew that, how much how much air and gases comes and how it comes in separate. and. It, it was fascinating. I got very little done the first day the sap ran when we had it. It's been, oh gosh, I don't know, probably at least 10 years ago now, but I, I, then I'm, I honestly got very little done that day because I was standing watching sap run and how it ran. It, I was fascinated with it. Uh, learned a lot there and it has definitely made finding hollow trees much, much easier uh, if, you're not, if you're not using some sort of clear spout, I would highly suggest that. I think it really, really helps. Go ahead. 90 versus a 30 degree What would be an advantage to an angled spout, or a 30 degree angled spout, or anything but 90? Can you think of one? I've heard breathe less freezing. Yeah, I don't think so. Can the sap get out of the spout easier? Well, sap doesn't come out of my spout it's like a fire hose. It gets out okay uh, in a 90 degree spout. There is no advantage to a, a 30 degree or whatever they call it spout, but a lot of disadvantages. How do you tap that spout into the tree? You've got a, a barb now, uh, the, the nipple of the spout sticking outside of where you're gonna be hitting on that spout. Awful good chance you're gonna whack that once and crack it, but you don't notice it. And now you've got a leak. So um, I, I'm not a fan of and those angles. And those nipples tend to be really small. Yeah. So hitting it, you can hit it at an angle and you wouldn't even really realize it. So you're exactly. to having a nice flat surface is better, I think, to hit it in. Good. And brings up another point. I've had a lot of guys tell me they don't like clear spouts, polycarbonate spouts, because when they're pounding them in, half of them break. Does that give you a clue? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, on the other end of this, pulling caps um, in the T's that you hook them onto, 
what do you guys prefer to do? I assume you're replacing taps every year. Um, do you do that when you're tapping, or do you do them when you're pulling? Uh, that That's up to you, honestly. Um, we don't do it while we're untapping because we have 23,000. We'd have to carry all that spouts out. If we redo a new section with new drops, we'll put them on for that. So it kind of speeds us up tapping. But while we pull it off, we just cut it. We pull it out of the tree, cut it. And then I, uh, I, we have our vacuum on while we untap. So I'll do the old <laughs> my finger across it. And then we plug it. We plug it because we have animals. So we have to make sure that nothing's hanging. Plug it. You onto the T. The nope, the tubing tap back onto the T. After you try to get the liquid out of the cut, tap. Cut the tap off, cut the tap off the drop, cut the tap off the drop, and put the, tea, put the tubing back on the T. Okay, so you remove the T's. Nope, T stays there, the I mean, tap. You remove the taps mm -hmm. when you pull them. Yep. But you put the new ones on. I only put new, I, oh, I only, yes, when we tap, yes, yes. So you do half the process when you pull it. You get rid of the old tap, and then you put the new one on in the spring when you tap. Yes. Um, to that, I'll, I'll, by, by the way, all three of us use a single spe piece spout. We came to that conclusion yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, we pull with vacuum on, cut spouts, plug them to our tees. Um, the, the, one of the reasons for me with the one piece spout is that is, is a place where you can use very unskilled labor. Putting spouts on does not take a degree in, in uh, engineering or tapology. <laughs> um, I, I can show somebody how to do that in about five minutes and sure do they make mistakes, but their mistakes, the mistakes that they would make there, I catch it when I'm tapping. If they crinkle one on or something, I catch it and just just fix it then. And that's, I'm still farther ahead if I have to I have to fix a few mistakes that they made there. Um, and it's a good place for somebody to start. Uh, my daughter, I don't know if she's here, but she she put a, she put some on for me this year. It's a good place for them to start for you to start learning to use the tubing tool because it's an extremely easy fitting to put in. Um, you know. With, 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 with doing what we do when you go to a woods with somebody and you take a tubing tool and show them how to put drop lines in and stuff, um, you start seeing the frustration because they watch us do it and it's just, you know, you're talking and they'll lean it over your shoulders, you're putting a fitting in and then they pick it up and don't know what to do with it. Um, I think it's a good place to start learning a tubing tool and there's not a lot you can mess up there. No, I don't want anything not maple in there, personally. So the way I see it is that the, if there is bacteria in there, bacteria and sap growth makes darker syrup. Okay, I have a retail market. I want dark syrup. That's how I look at it. We hear so many different theories. It is. Yeah, there's a lot of theories. Yeah. That, I, I, I've been, I know Glenn a lot more than me uh, yesterday on all the panels like this I've ever been on. Yesterday was the first time that everybody agreed on <laughs> on what they did. Mm -hmm. And and my story on it uh, alluded to this yesterday. I would love to have gotten paid $2 an hour for the labor I've tried to spend, uh, that I have used cleaning tubing over the years. Um, and back when we, all the different practices we did, here's how we did it. First, a little bit of sap had come, and it's kind of got that, this is cleaning tubing. It's got that little bit of funky green. We're gonna pump that on the ground. Next sap that comes is gonna have some cloud to it. We're gonna take that and boil it and make syrup with it. The next day sap is crystal clear. Now that we don't do anything as far as a cleaning process, other than pull spouts with the vacuum on, guess what we do? That first little bit of green sap goes on the ground. The next little bit of sap's cloudy, and the next day it's crystal clear. Um, I would I would love to have the labor hours back that I have spent attempting to clean tubing. It's same here. Uh, we've done everything you can imagine. 
I used to build machines that blended compressed air and high pressure water together to push water up the hill. It was cumbersome. We had to haul water to the woods. Uh, it was painful, especially at a cold day. Your hands just freeze and uh, it's nothing anybody looks forward to. We always tried to pick a school vacation week to do the tubing <laughs> washing. And my girls hated me <laughs> that week. <laughs> Sometimes it lasted two weeks. And uh, long story short, we pull spouts now, no vacuum on. We cut the spout off, we put the spout in their pouch, let the drop line hang straight down. We're now using drop line tubing that's pre-cut and never been in a roll, so it doesn't want to curl up and uh, it drains everything out and the system is dry and whatever bacteria is in there it doesn't grow when we put water in there to wash with the water collects some bacterial stuff out of the tubing and then can grow bacteria really nice all summer and so we found we were doing more harm than good by pushing water through the network and trust me, at Eden, there is absolutely no way we could pressure wash that system. Um, it just couldn't work. And so the easiest thing we found turns out to be the best thing we found. And, uh, uh, the, the, the one thing I'll allude to, the labor that you spend <laughs> doing cleaning tubing, do a little bit of this instead. Replace some drop lines. I think you are so much farther ahead if you want to compare your labor time to putting in some new drop lines um, rather than cleaning tubing. Way farther ahead. Oh, we got lost. There was a question over here. No. Anybody here work in EMS or rescue work? Okay, so you've got a patient with a laceration and there's something in there, uh, a piece of twig or something. You pick it out? No. You deliver that patient to the hospital where in an extremely sanitary environment, they would then pick it out. Um, anything we would use to pull a chip out of that hole would contaminate the hole and blowing in it's the worst thing a piece of sawdust in a spout kit i bet you the sap gets right by it anyway um we got high vacuum and it's probably not gonna plug it completely uh, and so we don't introduce anything into that hole the other thing is using the right drill bit and the right technique on the drill gets most of that debris out of the hole anyway. So when you go in, you know some guys when they run a chainsaw, I guess they have to pump the throttle to make the chainsaw go. <laughs> and drills, they kind of like to run the same way. But when I run a chainsaw and I lay that chain on the chunk of wood I'm going to cut, it's wide open right through to the bottom of the cut. And if you go to timber sports competitions, that's how they do it, to cut the fastest. Drilling a hole, when I when that drill bit touches bark, it's the drill is wide open and it doesn't change until it's out of the bark again. So when you drill that way, all that debris comes out on the drill bit. It's really rare that you'd see anything stuck in the hole. And every hole should be perpendicular to the tree, not this upward angle we used to think was better. Even for buckets, it wasn't better, but we thought it was better because sap runs downhill out of the tree. Well, we got ideas that make it run downhill, uphill, sideways, it doesn't matter. We'll get it. Yes? How many holes to a bit? <clears throat> Reference? 3,000 is what we target and we do not sharpen a drill bit. 
nobody has a drill grinder that does the same angles that our drill bits are ground to. So we don't chuck. Even though these drill bits are wicked expensive. Yeah, we would get through a season basically with ours. We we tap 2,600 total between two of us and we both start with a new bit every year. So every one of my guys starts with a new one. So my help, my help taps about 200 per bit before he loses it in the snow. I usually tap <laughs> around 14 or 1,500 to answer that question. I think he lost five this year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice new clean bits. <laughs> Way back here. Good. Uh, our target at Eden is three years, and then a complete tubing change in 12 years, and a complete mainline and tubing change at 24 years. And by 24 years, I'll be 48. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What's the best way you guys found the carrier drop? Great question. So ours look like this. They're perfectly straight. We've made up uh, a strap that will cinch at the top end where the T is and cinch at the back end. And then that strap goes over your neck on your shoulder and you can carry them at your side. No way to carry them is easy. It's always cumbersome, but that's what we found to work the best. We built uh, Robin Hood quivers to go on your back. That sort of good, but you can't duck under lines. Um, this way seems to work the best for us. Just, the the Just the T's. Okay. Yeah. We're installing drop lines all summer. Um, so I don't want new spouts out there in hot weather. We do, we do 25 in a bundle when we're making them. Uh, fairly heavy zip tie. I zip tie them. I can put 175 pretty good tucked in different places on my work belt. And what I found with that zip tie, um, as, as I, I put the tee up, as I pull them out, I can keep tightening that zip tie. Nice. Mm, that's a good idea. And that, that keeps them tight. Yeah. Uh, that's work. That's work the best for us. Yeah. The strap for you do the same thing. Same thing. You can they keep cinching. Yeah. 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 So we have, we have two guys that kind of go out together when we do that. So one guy basically carries a big bundle and the other guy has a two-handed tool. So he puts it on, the other guy's getting things ready. So it's in concert. Yeah. Uh, real quick, back to the drop line change. We're on a three-year rotation. I'll speak to that a little bit because we are in the third year of our rotation. So uh, when we started all our tubing in the woods looked like this. Um, so we started the first year, I think I begged you to make that because you wanted to play with colors. Remember that, Kevin? Um, and he said, you better buy it because we're never going to probably make these colors like this again. <laughs> uh, we went to yellow our first year of our rotation. Um, the reason we went to color was I felt like, yeah, we're going to replace this main line. But what about the lateral lines that had a bunch of chews in that? What about those ones that we just put in last year? Uh, so we're in the third year, so our woods looks, it's these three colors. Uh, last year was pink, this year was orange. Again, not a research facility, but the difference in visual in them that when we were pulling spouts is absolutely amazing. You, you can see the progression. Um, so it actually, the, we'll do it the way I want to do it and the way my third grade mind came up with our theory of how we were going to do this. We needed three colors, so next year blue will be in place of everything, yellow, pink will get replaced with yellow, and so on, right down the line. I do have gray now. I have not had any gray in the woods yet. Uh, but that's what, that's what we're doing to be on a three-year rotation. Um, we go a little bit longer. We're on a six for the drops just because of our size. At this point, we're at our fifth year, so next year we'll start phasing it in. So we'll start working our way through. Yeah. First year on a drop, did you use a check drop? Yes. Again, again, to me, it's just the money thing makes sense to me. The what we finally come up with is twenty-two cents, twenty-six cents more. It's way less than a gallon of sap per tap that it needs to make me. I, and in my head, that that's that's a no-brainer to me.
first first year tapping that tree getting the sap gets pulled back, it's the same whether or not it's a first year or a 10 year. So check valves, yes. Okay, back here we had a question. Everybody catch that question. How do we hook conductor lines into wet dries? Uh, uh, no, main lines into it. Or main, main lines, lines excuse me. Sorry, said it wrong. So there's two types really. Um, a loop over or whip, they work fine. Uh, if it's a single main line, a conductor line that goes up the hill and a single main line uh, comes off it, that's your most economical method, but be sure to put a valve on the main line. Um, mm -hmm. And so now it's gonna be a barbed valve on each side. When it's a double conductor line up the middle and main lines both sides, then we use a stainless steel uh, manifold there and equipped with valves, that then becomes more economical. Every time you cut into that wet dry system, you've got to put expensive fittings in there. And uh, so we're cutting in just once for two main lines and with good results. Um, so there's either one will work. The bonus of the manifold that we build is that if you have a problem on a wet line, frozen, uh, backed up, whatever, and sat jumps up into your airline with our system it can drop back down in at the next junction down the hill mm -hmm. uh, with the whips it can't it's going to yeah. stay in that airline which isn't totally bad it gets in the right place but it inhibits the airflow through your airline but it also tells you at your releaser there's a problem up on the hill somewhere mm -hmm. go and find it so either one will work it's a, just a matter of preference. Um, making stainless steel manifolds, there's an art to it. You have to use pipe dope on the female fittings, thread tape on the, the male fittings, and tighten them in really good. <coughs> stainless steel does not like to seal. And our first year with them, we had leaks. So. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have a little bit of both in, in uh, our woods. Um, and as we're moving forward, I'm phasing the canister style out. I, I really like the whips. Uh, with the monitoring, we are carrying, you know, I, I thought that we wouldn't get quite as good a separation and it wouldn't work quite as good. And I'm not seeing any. Uh, way simpler to install uh, for us, anyhow. Um, so we we went to the went to the whips. If somebody doesn't know what we're talking about on that, we can a couple of us can demonstrate to your attempt to draw you a picture of what we're talking about the yeah. whips versus the thing. Can you hang off after? after. Yeah, I, yeah. I have we'll, some pictures I can show you. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I probably do too. Come yeah. to think of it. Go ahead. Uh, what kind of entry system do you guys use for your lateral to your main line? So the the entry system you use? Main line entrance. Yes. Yeah. Saddles, yeah. Yeah. No, I don't trust him. I don't either. Uh, I know the guy that brought that technology to Maple. Uh, he's a really smart guy, and uh, he works in industries and engineer and uh, Chuck Welch up in Western New York State, and he uh, introduced it. CDL kind of came in and took it over from him. I don't know what the arrangement was. But here's what's happening. <coughs> You're trying to weld a fitting into the wall of a pipe by friction in the woods under varying weather conditions, temperatures. And in ideal conditions in a laboratory, it would work first time every time. But in the woods, it could come out wrong for you. And if it does, you've got a major problem. You now have a hole in the wall of your pipe. And sometimes it can 
where that friction stopped, it makes a weak spot in the pipe. Sometimes it's a hole the size of a dime. And the only fix is put a mainline connector in and start over. When you have to start over, now you have to lug all that machinery back into the woods to make that one repair. And what time of year is it then? It's probably cold. And <laughs> how many seconds do you set it for? It's kind of complicated and it's not a good thing for everybody to use. We've had extremely good results with the H2O uh, saddles. They seal the hole, not the surface of the pipe. And it's rare that we ever have one that leaks. And while we're on that, if you hear one leaking, nine times out of 10, it's not the saddle that's leaking. It's something further up your pipe. You're just hearing the airflow through that fitting in the main line. And so you stand there and you put a new saddle in it still leaks. Uh, so check up the line first and make sure it's not that. I, I think to Glenn's point on a spin seal, I think it's a, a very, very, very good concept. Don't know that I'm in full trust of some of the execution of it. Um, but I will tell you, we use our main lines being uh, smaller woods in Ohio. All our main lines are three quarter inch. Uh, we use three quarter inch uh, quick seal. I don't go to bed worrying about my main line entrances. I, we don't have an issue with them. What do you use three quarter inch? The, yes. From quick seal leaders, the leader quick seal entrance, yes. I, I like the leader ones just because they're quick to install and if there is a problem, they're quick to fix. We don't need another tool. We don't need something extra. And I, I think they seal well. And back. Do you have any opinions on the, uh, the inline connectors that uh, the, the little inline tube screw on fitting that accommodates uh, lateral Very good opinion. Uh, in the day, that's all we had. And it was the thing to use. But if you just look at how those star fittings are made, they're molded from both sides. There's always a flash mark around the side. They don't seal, they leak, the barbs will break off. Um, and you have to know where you're gonna put a cluster of lateral lines when you put the main line in uh, to install those things. With a saddle fitting, you don't have to know that. And trust me, when you use those, you're gonna find, oh shoot, I should have put one in there, but now the main line's under tension, so you really can't. And so we went to saddle fittings long, long ago. I'm gonna guess 15, 20 years ago when they first came that, out. That was kind of a big change, at least in our area, to go to, boy, this expensive fitting and we can only get one line in yeah. it. You know, and then when you started taking people out and showing them how much farther they were running their tubing and how much more expensive it was to install it the way that they were installing it, because of the amount of extra tubing, and not only that, cutting down on performance of the system, um, the the single saddle to me is is the only the only some sort of single standalone entrance is the only way to go. It seems like to me that if you put more tubing out, you get more production, better production. So it's it's almost like people still use them as a shortcut because they got a bunch going on or they think they can get all to one spot, but they doesn't perform well. So the point is a a good performing system so it's cheap in the beginning but it costs you more in the long run i i have the ends of main lines that have five or six of them stacked you know within this far and yeah. one one right next i mean to back in the day it was like well they all come right here i i can use doesn't even phase me we've been doing that long enough with single entrances that that's just how we do it now mm -hmm. go ahead like you said with utilizing tube and how many drops on the lateral I like five or below. It depends on the length between your main line. So I go between 75 and 100. If it's one, it's one. If it's five, it's five. If there happens to be six and seven in a straight line, it all comes down to whether or not we're straight. We avoid the really sharp turns. Um, Flat ground, what's your... Uh, we, we try where we can to do 100 foot main line spacing. Um, 
I, and mainline spacing with me has a little bit to do maybe with tap density too. If it's a high tap density, I'll space it a little closer. Are you on both sides? We have to a lot of places. I would prefer not to ever. Yeah. Um, I prefer one side for ease of uh, tapping. In, 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 a great, in a great world, yes, one-sided, but we, we have to, to get fall. We have to come both sides. That's where you send the help to work fix leaks in those sections that are coming from both sides. <laughs> um, but yeah, kind of try to keep less than 100, 120 feet. And then we don't zigzag. The tap numbers kind of takes care of itself then. Um, five, five or more. I, you know, I don't even really count and consider that. I just go straight and it is what it is. If it's one, it's one. If it's seven, it's seven. But we, we sell them. I think mo most of the woods, I always, uh, one's, uh, I don't do as much installing now as I used to, but I would usually average about 2.7 to 2.8 per lateral line as an average when I installed woods. And if we did an experiment, uh, vacuum monitoring is something we do, and I think it's going to be a session on that later. Well, yeah, later. Yeah. Okay. Um, we purposely set up a, a lateral line with 30 taps on it. A vacuum monitor at the top and one at the bottom. And we actually measured higher vacuum at the top than we did at the bottom. Because gravity is pulling the sap down the hill, overcoming any resistance that's in the line. So it isn't totally about thinking you're going to get more production. Uh, production is directly related to vacuum level. So we got every bit as much production out of that 30 tap run but it's a maintenance issue. Um, where are you going to have a leak when you walk up a main line? At the far end of that 30 tap line. And that 30 tap line is 500 feet long. You don't want to hike clear up there. Plus, the likelihood that somewhere along that 500 feet is going to get sucked under the snow, uh, it becomes a maintenance issue. Or even just a sag for animals. Yeah. We see that a lot. You just one little sag and it's just high enough for a coyote to <laughs> yeah. one bite yeah. and then walk away. Yeah. So we don't keep tight mainline spacing for production reasons. And that's contrary to what most people think. We do it for maintenance reasons. Mm -hmm. And if you have 500 foot lateral lines, how long can your mainline be? If you're getting 30 taps on every run, uh, that main line can't be very long before it's loaded right up. So it's all about getting the best bang for your buck on every ounce of plastic you put in the woods. And, and you're saying load it up because we need airspace mm -hmm. with a vacuum. So it can't be loaded up. Otherwise you're not getting the vacuum to the tree. And yep. it's not the matter of the vacuum at your releaser, it's the vacuum at the tree. Yep. 10 years ago, I was eight or 10 and lately five, but can I go lower and improve it or, you know? To be honest, I don't think you're going to improve production as long as your main lines are big enough and short enough to accommodate those extra taps on each run. So balance that equation. How do you know how many taps are going to be on the main line when you install it? You haven't put the tubing out yet, so you don't really know. We figure out what our average tap density is. And to count trees, I pick a, a circle, just an imaginary circle in the woods that's 37 and a half feet in radius. And I count the taps that are in that circle. Multiply it by 10, you need a calculator for that. And that'll give you the taps per acre. Once I know the taps per acre, if my main line is gonna be 700 feet long and I'm using a spacing of 120 feet. I can easily do the math and know how many acres. How many square feet in an acre? Anybody know? Oh, nice. Wow. <laughs> exactly. So, hey, what? nice. And it, they said he was a teacher. He didn't know nothing. Right. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we then can tell you as we're installing that main line how many taps are going to be on it and then make a judgment call is it adequate or not and uh, so that's how i build the system is knowing the density then the spacing the length tells me if i'm okay or not yeah. so i've heard um, 
method for your entry on the lateral. You use a slide fitting, an end hook, a dead T. What, what, what are you guys doing? Dead T and a hook. Yeah. Uh, we use either a hook. Uh, we kind of went back. Part of it was because I had a pile of them left with the wrong style plug on them, the, the old end rings. Uh, but we still use them with a dead T. We don't use the end ring, end it ring part of it. I, everybody knows the end it ring, it went through and then all the way around the tree. Um, I had a pile of those from the equipment business left and decided we we're going to use them up. And I still kind of like the ring in places better than the hook. You can you can uh, move it and we, tension it. You can move it, and that is not an excuse for not having your lateral lines tight. But every once in a while, you get a limb sag or something in the season. Rather than having to fix it right then and there, you can just tighten on it where you can't with hooks. Um, and and you, you know we work pretty hard again in flat ground. We have to work pretty hard to have, you know, when you're running with one percent slope, it doesn't take much sag to be out of slope. If you got a really high squirrel area, the end hooks or the dead end tee are the way to go. Because I've seen some places where the squirrels run up and down the tree on that end tree and chew the snot out of that to where it's literally just like very little bit, even holding that thing. And if that, you got a tap there, that's, that's a huge leak. We have a rule too when I'm, when, uh, for repair work in our woods. You don't repair a drop line, you replace a drop line. If a drop line has an issue, we replace it. Mm. So we always have new drop lines, the color of the year with us. Uh, to replace and with the dead end tee, we can just kind of keep moving them out to a certain extent past the leak. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. There's a dead end and it's a two tap on the end. Where do you put the two tee? Do you put it three quarter halfway across the yeah. tree or do you kind of keep them close together? Not close together. Yeah. It, it, the a two tap tree, if there is such a thing, <laughs> hint, hint. it's got a big circumference. If you put those tees close together, you're not going to reach all that circumference. So we put them about 180 degrees apart. I, I'll just say make sure you can see them. Yeah. <laughs> no. so there's quite a few we've done in the past where it's in the back and you just don't know it's there. Let's so, back up just a little bit okay. on the materials. Um, you know, as far as technique on materials, differences in materials, can you talk a little bit? A little bit about that in from lateral lines, main lines, and some of the other things. Okay. I love the new dark blue high density pipe that Leader has. It's not made in house right now. It's made in Minnesota, Wisconsin. Right? Yeah, west, yeah. Yeah, out west somewhere. H D, yeah. Um, when you pull that through the woods, right away you notice a difference. If you pull a medium density pipe through the woods, we found on each pipe, it's going to take a guy about every 300 feet to pull that and to do it all day. The high density pipe, we can pull 700 feet per guy nicely through the woods. So what's that tell you? The friction about that pipe touching anything, whether it be the ground, grass, weeds, trees, is higher with a medium density pipe. Now think about the interior of that pipe. How's sap going to travel through it? Is it going to be the same coefficient of friction inside that there is outside? Spec so. It's mirror finish inside. Stuff does not like to stick to it. Um, it's lighter per foot. A thousand foot coil of high density pipe is much lighter than a thousand foot coil of medium density pipe. Now, nothing wrong with Canadian pipe, but none of the Canadians will now make high density pipe. They haven't figured out how. So leader going to this Western manufacturer, they're a pipe company. That's what they do. And they figured it out. Um, if you use black pipe, like Oil Creek, Charter Plastic, they figured it out too. Their machines can extrude high density pipe very effectively. But I don't recommend for most of you to use black pipe. Um, we've got it in some places, especially north slopes, west slopes. But where it's warmer, we definitely want to be using a colored pipe. Um, and uh, 
the tubing that we like is the Max 4 grit. Um, at Eden, we have 6,000 rolls of that installed. There is nothing else for tubing, lateral line tubing in Eden, than Max 4 grit. And same at Cabot. So I suspect maybe we're one of the larger users of that tubing, and uh, we buy it by the thousands of rolls at a time. Um, and I install for other people too, so that's what we use. Seals fitting's really good, it's smooth inside, it's uh, uh, low coefficient of friction when it runs through your hand as you're installing it, or when sap's flowing through it coming down the hill. And it's like a Teflon fry pan. I mean, maybe not Teflon, that's old, isn't it? <laughs> but a non-stick fry pan. Stuff does not like to stick to it. So how is that particular tubing for stretching? Some that's more... Exactly. I don't want tubing to stretch. So that's a more rigid... Tubing. I put it up tight when I install it. We double check it as the drop lines go in. Sometimes you take out a little piece, but it's tight then. Ten years later, it's still tight if nothing else changed. Now a tree fall down, yeah, you gotta do something about it, but uh, you put it up tight, it stays tight. I, I played around a little bit when I wasn't in a hurry when we're in the woods in the summer. It has enough memory in it. I've had it sagged clear to the ground in the summer and thought, I'm gonna take it off and see what happens from a limb, sag clear to the ground, and come back two, three days later and it's back up where it was supposed to be yeah. with the memory in it. Uh, it's. It's a good tubing. I played with Uni 50 this year. Uh, put, I put up about a dozen rolls in our woods. Was very impressed with how it went in. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm just, just going to hand this out. We'll, so we'll, light, blue, light blue is grip, dark blue is Uni 50, and then the yellow is flex. But we'll stand by. I don't have an opinion form yet on the Uni 50 because we just put some. I just put some in. I'm not going to tell you it's the worst thing or the greatest thing ever because I just put it in. <clears throat> Um, so far through the season, it looked like it was holding up relatively well. Uh, really takes fittings nice. I, w I was impressed with how it takes fittings. So Glenn, you're using the light blue and then the dark blue for drops. We use different colors for drops. No, but I mean, he just said that there are two different tubings here. Yes. Uh, the Three. light blue is what we use for lateral lines, but we'll use something that's really obtrusive for drop lines. Um, and that's a big word for you. I know, <laughs> I don't know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow, how did I do that? Uh, <laughs> because we want to see if the drop line's hanging, and I like to put all my drop lines on the low side of the tree. So from the main line, you can look up the lateral line and see if there's something hanging. Um, and uh, it makes that work a lot easier. That's why you only put one tap for a tree, because then the tree tap would be on the other side. It would be, that's not the only reason, but it, it's kind of a reason. And we do have trees with two taps. Um, but yeah, it, it's, that's a tough game. What is a two tap tree and what's a one tap tree? And, and that's your judgment call. But one of the things that plagues our tapping team the most is missing drop lines. And you know, they don't miss one in a hundred, but they're missing a few every day. And as the season gets underway, that turns into a big number. And that's the biggest battle to get those fixed, um, to get your vacuum up. Yes. What's your favorite time to install tubing? Anytime that somebody's got money. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. I actually install quite a lot of tubing while my crew is tapping. Okay? I'm expendable on the tapping team. Uh, I don't, now I don't tap any more in a day. I probably don't do any better job than my team does. But I can do things installing that they can't do. So I'll often be out on a job and that keeps the checkbook hinges greased up just a little bit so I can make payroll. Uh, so that sounds really crazy, but it works for us. And um, 
I'm hoping this year maybe I don't have to do that. So whether it's warmer, colder, it doesn't it doesn't matter. We we used to not install tubing in the summer because I was doing other things, but we install a lot in the summer now. As long as long as you're putting it in correctly, it's tight and yeah. everything's situated, it's not gonna move whether it's warm or cold. Right. That's the point. I prefer a day it's not raining. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got about seven minutes left, so we'll allow a couple more questions. So one of the manufacturers was saying that the quarter inch tab produces half the amount of dead zero at the five sixteenth. Did you guys address that? I believe it. Um, I think we get the same amount of sap and less damage to the tree. So it's something we're moving into and uh, looking very seriously at that. I wanted to move to it last year, but we couldn't get quarter inch outs. So we're likely going to move to quarter inch outs this year. And one question that we've had the last session um, that I want to make sure we touch on. Anybody in here have trouble with squirrels? <laughs> Put your hand up if you have trouble with squirrels. Do you ever work on tubing barehanded? Don't. Always gloves on your hands when you work on tubing. It's not a guaranteed cure, but anytime we touch something, a CSI guy could now find my fingerprints on this bottle. A squirrel is a CSI guy. <laughs> he can find your fingerprints on whatever you touch. And so a really good criminal wears gloves, doesn't he? Well, we need to be a really good criminal for our squirrels and wear gloves when we handle tubing because we're leaving oils and salts from our skin on that tubing. And whether you can see it or not, the squirrel can sense it. So he, we, I've seen it many times where we know we've touched even mainline and the squirrel chewed the ribbons out of it before ever sap went in it. And why did he do that there? So learn to study, like you said, clear spouts. You stood there and studied for a while. Study what's going on. What is it plaguing you or that you've achieved well? Study those things and either replicate it if it's a good thing or get rid of it if it's a bad thing. Yeah, this, is, this is an evolving process. We gotta constantly Absolutely. change. I've been doing this 122 years and I don't know half of what I'd like to know. Um, we're always learning and always figuring out new ways to do things. I spent the early part of my career trying to figure out how to turn a two-guy job into a one-guy job, okay? Labor is a challenge for all producers, especially large producers. And how can we get the best bang for your buck out of your own labor? That's an any business. Sure. Or the labor that you hire. And people just can't find enough people these days to do um, the work that we need to do. So try to turn one guy job, uh, two guy jobs into one guy jobs if you can. Tapping. Anybody remember tapping with two guys? One guy drills a hole, the other guy puts a spout in. And that's a carryover from buckets, isn't it? Because the drill you had to drill bucket spouts was probably an uh, engine on your back and a cord around and uh, you can't put a spout in when you're wearing that thing. So people would then come along with the spouts, put the spouts in, another guy puts the bucket on, another guy puts the cover on. And so it's a, a four guy job and you're not very productive. Ruth told me that was a condition of your probation office. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>